Okay, uh, thanks everyone for sticking around after lunch. So my name is Lindsay Liebert, and I'm here to present my research on antimicrobial resistance in E. coli and salmonella in smallholder chickens. So antibiotic resistance is a problem right now. So it's a concern that continues to grow in Canada and outside the world. And part of this is because resistance is so easily acquired by bacteria through um, mutation or horizontal gene transfer uh, from other bacteria. So these uh, transfers of genes has led to the um, prevalence of bacteria with multi-drug resistances or superbugs. And right now, like these are becoming a continuing problem in various areas such as human health care, veterinary medicine, and the food industry. So all of these directly or indirectly impact human health. So recently the WHO has gone on to say that the world is headed for a post-antibiotic era, but this is why antibiotic resistance is so important to study and monitor. So by studying and monitoring it, um, we allow the creation of methods to better control and slow its spread. So specifically in the food industry, studying the causes of antibiotic resistance along the food chain helps to find ways to control the spread of resistant bacteria from food animals to humans. So uh, just a little bit about foodborne illness. Um, I'm sure as you all know, foodborne illness is the result of consuming contaminated food. And contamination can be caused by microorganisms anywhere along the food chain. So when you have a combination of antibiotic resistance and foodborne illness, you're running into some problems because now you've got an infection in your gut that can't or may not easily be treated by antibiotics. So that leads to some pretty nasty problems. So antibiotic use in livestock has been linked to antibiotic resistance in bacteria isolated uh, from these herds and flocks. So I really like the farm to fork approach because it really shows and gives a bigger picture and shows how uh, things that go wrong anywhere along the food chain can directly impact the food that is on your fork and headed straight for your mouth. But um, this is why uh, surveillance is such an important tool for antibiotic resistance. So that's what the Canadian Integrated Program for Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance does. So CPARS monitors trends in antimicrobial use and resistance um, in selected bacteria from a variety of components, one of which is the abattoir component. So CPARS abattoir monitors the prevalence of AMR from sequels for E. coli, Salmonella, and Campylobacter collected from commercial poultry flocks slaughtered in federally inspected abattoirs. So we're most interested in the CPARS abattoir component for this project. Um, annual reports are available online for CPARS. 2013 is the most recent report right now. Um, when we began this project, 2012 was the most recent report available. So we use that for our comparisons. And up until 2013, CPARS did not routinely monitor extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing E. coli in avatar sequel samples. But since this is uh, started up in recent years, data will probably eventually be available on that. So this brings us to our project. So CPARS does not perform surveillance on provincial abattoirs. Therefore, the smallholder flocks that um, go to these provincial abattoirs for slaughter are not included in CPARS results. So this project is a good way to give a comparison between the smallholder flocks and the flocks that are seen in the CPARS national study. So just a little bit on extended spectrum beta-lactamases, or ESBLs. These are enzymes that are characterized by resistance to beta-lactam drugs. So these drugs are penicillins and cephalosporins. Of particular importance are the higher generation cephalosporins, though, such as the third generation because they have a very high clinical importance. They're used frequently, and ESBLs confer resistance to them, so that does cause problems and poses a bit of a threat to uh, public health. And resistance is molecularly characterized by certain genes, and I'll just give you a quick little diagram of that. So if this is, if this is a cell, and we've got the genome, which all cells have, and, or all bacteria cells, sorry, but we have a plasmid too. And plasmids are very easily transferred between bacteria. And plasmids are the carriers, or the most frequent carriers of the uh, ESBL genes. So I've just got a little diagram of a plasmid with two genes, so BLAS, ETXM, and BLAS, SHIV. And these genes give rise to the ESBL enzymes that confer resistance to the um, antibiotics for the uh, bacteria cells that produce them. So they confer resistance by um, breaking the beta-lactam ring of the beta-lactam drugs. So that's just how they, their mechanisms work. 
So in Canada, there are two types of abattoirs. There's provincially inspected and federally inspected. There are currently 19 federally registered and 31 provincially registered abattoirs in Ontario. And these differ in several ways, one of which is regulating body. Uh, provincial abattoirs are regulated by OMAFRA and the federally registered abattoirs are regulated by the CFIA. Um, they also differ in veterinary oversight. So for federally registered abattoirs are required to have um, a veterinarian on site for slaughter, whereas the provincially registered abattoirs do not. Um, they also differ in slaughter value and construction. So typically, although there is some overlap, but typically the federally registered abattoirs have much larger operations. So these include commercial bird chicken flocks, um, which could be thousands of birds large, uh, whereas the provincial abattoirs um, they have small to medium sized operations. So that's where the flocks that we're most interested in are slaughtered. So our objectives for this study were to determine the prevalence of AMR in generic coli and salmonella from smallholder poultry flocks, so specifically chickens, and to determine the flock level prevalence of ESBL producing E. coli. So to start our sampling, uh, we went to six, parti uh, six participating provincially registered abattoirs in Ontario. And from them, we collected 161 flocks. So we performed a sample size calculation to get to that number. And what we did was for every flock, we collected five birds. So that gave us a grand total of 805 samples. So like I said, we only collected samples from smallholder flocks. So those that contain less than 300 chickens. And these are considered non-quota holding producers. So if you, uh, quota is a market to license and sell birds in Canada. So if you're a small holder flock with less than 300 birds, you do not have a quota. Uh, so what we did was um, we had the completely not gruesome job of going into the slaughterhouses during slaughter and standing at the evisceration station. And we collected five viscera from those five birds that were sampled per flock. Where we, and upon which we brought the viscera back to the lab in order to isolate the cecum and extract the cecal content for primary isolation. So just to give you a better picture, um, this is the viscera, just a mass of internal organs and there's a lot of connected tissue. So we would carefully extract the cecum and what we would do from there is sterilize the outer contents with ethanol so that we did not introduce any external, external contamination into the cecal contents when we extracted them. And then we would perform primary isolation of the cecal contents for generic E. coli, salmonella, and ESBL producing E. coli. So the isolation of generic E. coli and salmonella was fairly simple. Uh, we started with enrichment by broth, uh, followed by selective plating and biochemical, biochemical and confirmation testing. Whereas for the ESBL producing E. coli, we started with selective plating using chrome agar, followed by selective plating and biochemical confirmation testing for generic E. coli. And finally, we used the disdiffusion method uh, with the CLSI screen for ESBL producing E. coli guidelines. So just to give you a better idea of what the disdiffusion method is, we used four antibiotic infused discs, uh, cepotaxime, cepotaxime clavulanic acid, ceftazidime, and ceftazidime clavulanic acid, and we placed them on a lawn of our suspect ESBL isolate. Um, and what we ha should see is um, a five millimeter difference between the zone of clearing of the clavulanic acid disc and non-clavulanic acid containing disc. And the non-clavulanic acid containing disc should not exceed a certain diameter. So as you can see here, this one is a suspect ESBL because um, it fits the CLSI guidelines. And from there, all of our suspect isolates for E. coli, salmonella, and ESBL E. coli uh, were sent to the CPARS AMR lab at LFZ, where they completed our antimicrobial susceptibility screen using the NARMS public health panel. And from there, they gave us the overall bacterial prevalence rates and antimicrobial susceptibility results, which we then compared to the abattoir component of uh, the CPARS 2012 annual report. So just jumping into our results, um, we've got some interesting results for the E. coli and salmonella prevalence. Um, firstly, the E. coli was very similar between the two avatar types. So the CPARS results are in yellow and smallholder results are in blue. And this is exactly what we would expect to see. We would expect to see near 100% uh, levels of E. coli prevalence in sequel samples. So we saw 100% in CPARS and 99% in our smallholder flocks. But where it got really interesting was the salmonella results. So over here, we only saw a 0.4 prevalence rate in our salmonella, 
And the salmonella prevalence from the sea parcel ox is relatively higher than that. Um, so yeah, we weren't expecting that at all. But one thing to also note, uh, make note of is that sea pars only took one sample per flock, whereas we took five, so they could not complete flock level prevalence. But our flock level prevalence for salmonella isolates was only 1.2%. And I'll just walk you through the uh, E. coli AMR results quickly. So the uh, 15 antibiotics along the side here are from the CPARS, the same panel that the CPARS uh, results used. And they're classed by importance to human medicine. So group one is most important here and group three is least important. And again, yellow is CPARS and blue is small holder. And what the bars represent is the percentage of isolates resistant to those antibiotics. So as you can see, these results varied. Our smallholder E. coli had a lower proportion of resistance to almost all of the antibiotics tested, um, except for ciprofloxacin and azithromycin. But even here, the number of resistant isolates were generally low. So this just goes to show that there was a difference in the levels of antibiotic resistance between the two flock types. And for salmonella, all three sal smallholder salmonella isolates were Saravar, Kentucky. And this is worth comparing to CPARS because as Kentucky was also the most prevalent Saravar um, detected by CPARS. So for our smallholder Salmonella, all three isolates exhibited resistance to tetracycline and streptomycin. And the most frequent resistances found in the CPARS isolates were also um, tetracycline and streptomycin. And overall, the CPARS isolates exhibited resistance to 11 of the 15 antimicrobials tested whereas we only saw resistance in the smallholder flocks to two out of 15. And some of the CPARS isolates were also multi-drug resistant. Now, just to get into the ace bale producing E. coli, um, through our original selective plating and disc diffusion, we found 59 potential ESBL producing phenotypes. But after sending them off to LFZ for AMR screening, we found that only 48, per, or only 48 of these 59 um, could be considered ESBL producing phenotypes. So we considered it an ESBL producing phenotype if it was resistant to um, ampicillin, septiopor, and ceftriaxone. So that accounts for the cephalosporins and penicillin. And if it was susceptible to amoxicillin clavulanic acid, because clavulanic acid is an ESBL inhibitor. So those 48 isolates belong to 23 unique flocks. And just over half of the positive flocks had only one positive isolate um, from the five birds. Whereas the remaining 48% did have multiple ESBL producing isolates, and 13% of the positive flocks had all five birds testing positive for ESBL producing isolates. So it's just shown along the bottom in the graph there. So um, what we found was that point estimates of salmonella prevalence and AMR prevalence in generic E. coli and salmonella were lower in the smallholder flocks. Um, the Salmonella cerevars associated with higher levels of resistance were not found in these flocks. Um, it's also worth noting that S. Kentucky has minimal clinical importance and importance to human health in Canada and the U.S., but it is more routinely found in human cases in Africa, Asia, and Europe. So it, when human cases do come about, it's uh, mostly travel related. Um, what we also found is ESBL producing E. coli may not be detected without the use of selective media. And when I went through the generic E. coli um, AMR data, I didn't see any isolates that fit the ESBL phenotype that we were looking for. So it is possible that isolates could be missed through generic um, isolation methods. And we think that smaller flock sizes, different hatch resources, and frequent antimicrobial use and free range management may contribute to these results which is why we'd like to do further surveys of smallholder producers so that we can get a better picture of what their flock management practices are, especially their antimicrobial use practices, um, both at the hatchery and on farm. Um, finally, we would do molecular characterization of potential ESBL producing isolates. So this is currently ongoing um, and it's going to include identification of ESBL genes through PCR, as well as identification of E. coli strains. So I'd like to thank um, all the institutions that provided funding, as well as the participating abattoirs and producers, and as well as the other authors of the study. Thank you. Thank you. We have about five minutes for questions. Anybody have any questions for Lindsay? Yep. What did you see the listing of Sorry, what did we say that? 
Okay, um, so we're trying to figure that out. Right now we suspect, here I'll just go back to that slide. Um, we suspect it would have to do with the smaller flock sizes as well as um, the hatch resources and the fact that the birds have a different lifestyle than the commercial uh, flocks would typically. Uh, what, sorry, I can't hear too well. Yes, they were uh, all Kentucky. One thing worth noting is that we only were able to do sampling from May or about June to September of last year because um, most smallholder producers don't winter their birds. It's more of just an outdoor thing they have in the summer. So that's definitely something to consider. SBLs, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that is contradictory. Uh, we weren't too sure why that would be or where these um, genes are coming from. That's part of the reason why we'd like to further the surveys on their antimicrobial use, just to get a better picture of where the genes are coming from. And was there anything um, what's, uh, in the age of the, of the farms? Are the smaller farms older and maybe have almost through practice refined a little bit more than some of these larger ones that might be newer and maybe still um, learning their way. Yeah, that's hard to see. Okay, so um, Andrew was just asking if, because some of the smallholder flocks may be older uh, farm practices, so maybe have their methods more refined compared to some of the uh, commercial flocks, which may not have been as old or been farming as, uh, for as many years. Um, that's a good question, just because our flocks come from a wide variety of people, so it could come from people who maybe have five uh, layers in their backyard, as well as people who might be raising a couple, like two to three hundred birds just for meat to sell on the side. So it is hard to say, and again that just comes back to the surveys because we want to get a better handle on what the different producers are doing so we can make those connections. Uh, yeah, we could look at Campylobacter because we have the raw samples preserved. Um, originally we didn't because the um, the original plans were to look at it, but that changed um, and they replaced Campylobacter with ESBLs, and that was just based on the interest of the PI. Any further questions? Thank you very much, Lindsay. Thank you.